Mofa. There we go. Um, MOFA is based on both uh, Treaty 1 and Treaty 2 territories, the homeland of the Dakota, Anishinaabe, Oji Cree, Cree, Dene, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. And we're also joined uh, by our guest speaker, who is a guest on Treaty 4, Dr. Mark Spooner. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have everyone out here tonight. This is a really great opportunity to start to build those bridges and to learn about um, a really uh, intricate piece of uh, policy that a lot of governments are moving forward with, with performance-based funding. Uh, we're really quite lucky to have Dr. Mark Spooner here, and the event tonight will be co-hosted uh, by Dr. Scott Forbes, who is the uh, Manitoba uh, Organization of Faculty Associations President and a Professor of Biology at the University of Winnipeg. Last night, we had uh, a discussion and uh, seminar uh, looking more so at the effects of smaller institutions. Uh, today, we're going to have a bigger picture look uh, at uh, how it's going to affect Manitoba. Um, for tonight, uh, we are going to try and keep it civil. We kept it very civil last night, and I very, very much appreciated that as the moderator and uh, person with the power to mute people at will. So uh, how we're going to do this is I'm going to momentarily uh, turn this over to Dr. Forbes, who will introduce Mark Spooner. Um, Dr. Spooner will speak for about uh, 20 to 25 minutes or however long he pleases. Um, and then we will open it up for a question and answer. Um, and I also just wanted to uh, recognize uh, and welcome uh, Kevin Rebeck from the Manitoba Federation of Labor, uh, certainly a strong partner uh, in protecting these rights that workers have fought for for many years. Uh, so after we have Dr. Spooner speak, we'll have uh, the Q&A. At that time, uh, we'll be taking questions via the raise hand function as well as the chat, kind of a hybrid model. Um, last night, uh, some folks uh, popped into the chat with questions um, and I just wanted to ask if it's all right to hold off on that, maybe write your questions down or keep a running document, uh, just because it throws off our presenter, because uh, they see stuff pop up and it throws them off their rhythm. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Dr. Forbes uh, and uh, wanted to just welcome everyone for making it up tonight. Okay, um, thanks Zach and, and thanks everyone for being here for the second of the MOFA webinar series on performance-based funding. Um, which is an urgent issue um, for uh, universities across our country. So I'm going to list a, a few universities here and, and um, I just want you to think about them. Um, Oxford, uh, Cambridge, uh, the University of California, um, the various campuses, Berkeley, Davis, Los Angeles, Riverside, Santa Cruz, uh, and others. Uh, the University of Michigan, um, the, uh, the University of Texas system, um, uh, William and Mary um, uh, in Virginia, the University of Illinois, University of Washington. Those, I think we would all agree, are either very good to great universities. Um, so the Manitoba government um, decided in its infinite wisdom that when it wanted to model a university system, it chose the University of Tennessee, um, which has campuses at Knoxville, Chattanooga, and Pulaski. Uh, which, which strikes me as an odd choice. Um, why would you um, choose to model yourself after a mediocre system as opposed to one of the, the great uh, university systems, uh, uh, public university systems? So part of the reason that Tennessee was chosen um, was that it was the first to introduce performance-based funding in the United States in the 1970s. Uh, and um, it has been uh, trying to get it right uh, ever since. Uh, so, uh, under performance-based funding, as you're going to hear tonight, um, uh, the state uh, imposes performance metrics on universities based on various criteria, uh, usually starting with things like graduation rates and, and time to graduation, a number of courses that students take. Uh, uh, they'll also integrate things like research performance. Uh, and these are all um, standards uh, which universities are expected to meet um, to, to receive public funding from uh, the state. Uh, the state of Louisiana has gone one step further. Um, it, uh, it ties both state funding and tuition increases uh, on hitting performance metrics. So um, if you don't hit your performance metrics, no funds for you. Um, and now uh, in the United States, more than two thirds of American states have introduced some form of performance-based funding. And it, it seems um, quite odd. Um, it's almost always when there's a Republican state government. Um, I just, I can't understand why that might be the case. Um, 
And what's um, particularly interesting is that there are right-wing governments um, in Canada, uh, most notably in on Ontario, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, which have a direct pipeline to the Republican counterparts um, through institutions like the Fraser Institute. Performance-based funding is sold to a gullible public um, as a way to one, improve efficiency uh, by introducing competition among campuses, or as we like to say, introducing an academic hunger, hunger games. Uh, and it's also used to, to, or it's also justified as a way to increase accountability uh, for spending of those precious public dollars. Uh, well, it, it's safe to say, and, and, and Dr. Spooner is gonna tell us about this, performance space funding hasn't done that. Um, indeed, it's really only done one thing well, and that is to provide cover for conservative governments um, and libertarian governments um, to defund public education. Um, and so that's, that's uh, been its principal objective uh, from the government side. Um, it undermines university autonomy um, and it turns our universities into handmaidens of government. And so we have to take this threat very seriously. Uh, it is new to many of us uh, and we need to educate ourselves rapidly about this threat uh, and we are really fortunate because the, the teacher at the front of our classroom tonight is Dr. Mark Spooner. Uh, and Mark um, is a professor in the Faculty of Education at the University of Regina. Uh, he specializes in qualitative research at the intersections of theory and action on the ground. Uh, his interests include audit culture, academic freedom, uh, the effects of neoliberalization and corporatization on higher education, as well as social justice, activism, and participatory democracy. He's published uh, in many venues, uh, including peer-reviewed books, um, journals, uh, government reports, uh, and, uh, and he's written some excellent um, popular uh, accounts of performance-based funding, which I've read and enjoyed. Uh, and he's co-editor co of the award-winning book, Dissident Knowledge in Higher Education. If you wanna follow him, he's on Twitter at Dr. Mark Spooner, and that's Mark with a C. Uh, and uh, I, I look forward to to hearing what Mark has to tell us. So, so Mark, um, please uh, uh, take it away. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Scott, and uh, for Zach and all of MOFA for the work you've done in organizing this series of seminars uh, yesterday and today. And it's a real honor to be here. I've, I feel very fortunate uh, that I've had the opportunity to meet many of my colleagues now in Manitoba and, and across the country really as faculty associations, student unions, and, and other groups kind of scramble and unite to fight what they know to be wrong, what they, what they know to be deleterious to the mission of our universities, and really to the health of our democracies. So across the country, conservative governments are attempting to myopically and cynically repurpose our universities. And they're using performance-based funding as the mechanism. And this is the most profound policy changes to come to the Canadian post-secondary sector in decades. On the bright side, increasingly student unions and faculty associations, our faculty unions, are taking up the fight to preserve the aspirational ideals of the university. Universities are being refashioned into entrepreneurial training centers. And make no mistake, these are ideologically based attempts to redesign the fundamental mission of our universities. The metrics coerce universities away from fostering critical and creative and well-rounded citizens while performing research in the public interest and instead toward a drastically retooled, narrowly conceived outcomes focused on serving the current labor market and performing corporate style research and development. In this struggle, what is at stake? is nothing less than the heart and soul of our universities. And as our democracy is revealed as increasingly fragile, these citizenship skills, habits of mind become all the more crucial and urgent to foster. And you know, this is a battle that we're up against. To, to some performance, it, it's hard to argue with. I mean, who's against performance? But let's be clear, under these models, performance has been ideologically and sharply reduced to mean labor market, industry, and economic outcomes. Heck, one might, one might as well call them deformance funding because that's what they're doing to the university. And there's nothing positive here for anyone, least of which are students and society. Students will be asked to shoulder even more of the tuition burden uh, 
and be provided with less choice while governments ascribe success based on future earnings rather than meaningful careers and healthy communities. And for society, these governments further chip away at one of the important pillars in our democracy, and that's the academy. I'm going to share my screen here and, and uh, let's see here. This going. Okay, here we go. I think that's working. This is us. And here's the too long didn't read. Basically, if you need to go and you want to take away some of the points from tonight, here it is. Performance based funding serves at least four functions. First, they are cloaked funding cuts. You just can't win. These aren't increases in funding. They're uh, competition for smaller pieces of the pie and the pie shrinks. It doesn't get bigger. We blame ourselves uh, as we compete with other groups rather than working together in collaboration. They fundamentally narrow the meaning of performance and how we define success. And in so doing, they change the mission of the university as well as erode the collegial governments and academic freedom traditions that are a cornerstone of the university, of the academy. And really what we're seeing here is just a continuation of the Thatcher days. This is uh, Margaret Thatcher uh, stripping away, breaking down the public sector and its uh, new public management techniques, which include adopting private sector management practices, introducing market style incentives and disincentives, introducing uh, customer orientation coupled with consumer choice and branding, devolving budget functions while maintaining tight control through auditing and oversight, outsourcing labor uh, with casual temporary staff, and emphasizing greater output performance measures and controls in the name of efficiency and accountability. Where does it start in Manitoba? Well, the Advanced Education Administration Act. And here uh, we look at accountability measures. It talks about uh, respect for government support provided to it, including performance measures for assessing the use of that support. And there we have it in the act, but then we move closer in time to Manitoba's skills, talent and knowledge strategy. I'm guessing many of you in the Zoom room tonight are quite familiar with this document. Um, but I want to take a little bit of time and, and look at this document. You know, it's, it starts off pretty good in the executive summary. We talk about um, uh, <laughs> some good jokes there. Some people are using, finding innovative ways to use this document. Uh, so uh, in the executive summary, it starts off pretty good. It says, uh, Manitoba's employers need creative and critical thinkers and team players who are skilled in analysis, communication and cultural awareness. Uh, these skills are crucial in all organizations, regardless of the size, and are equally important to entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. So it starts off good. The, other, the unfortunate part is that the critical and creative thinking these skills are not mentioned again in the document, or I think they pop up maybe one other time. And every time they are mentioned, it's always in the service of employers, not society. So uh, to take another look, to, to put this in context, if you search the document for keywords like citizen, democracy, uh, you won't find it. It's not in there. And, and I think that perhaps one of the ironies here is that the uh, entrepreneurs is misspelled. There's a spelling mistake there. And I think that's some foreshadowing about uh, the only place that really is kind of hopeful in this document. And even then it's always in the service of employers. Uh, they misspell entrepreneurs. So uh, let's take another look. So that's the, the best part of the document I could find in the executive summary, and then it's not mentioned again. Uh, you get to page nine, and page nine I want to spend a bit of time on. 
Here, the government asserts that universities and colleges will meet the challenges of becoming more nimble and responsive and quickly identify ways to shift programming more easily and quickly. The Manitoba government will modify its program approval uh, process. Post-secondary institutions will be tasked to identify and shift programs that oversupply the labor market, as well as programs, uh, opportunities in high demand areas. They will work in partnership with industry to rebalance programs and resources to align with industry needs. Talk about uh, one bullet point loaded with assumptions. One, that the university is not already nimble. Uh, but COVID has shown us that we are quite nimble. When pressed to, when, uh, when community safety is at risk, we can shift on a dime, and we did, uh, seamlessly shifting to an online presence, uh, ensuring that students were still able to access and be included in uh, higher learning. The other part here is there's an assumption that you're oversupplying the market already. I don't see any evidence of that. And then also that you're out of balance because uh, now we have to rebalance. So there's a, a, some, if you just did a content analysis on the one paragraph, you get a, an idea for the hidden assumptions in the, in the government's collective mind here. Uh, the next bullet, they talk about implement an outcomes-based funding model for colleges and universities to promote positive outcomes for students and alignment with industry needs. Uh, I wasn't convinced that the university wasn't already promoting positive outcomes, and I think many of us would agree that we are. Secondly, here you have it again, it's about industry needs, not societal needs, not community needs. And finally, the last bullet point, uh, you know, indicated by the red arrow that I'd like to focus on uh, for a bit here is uh, engage with institutions to design a new centralized data model to track student success and create new post-secondary funding model based on outcomes and performance. So what do we know? Well, the exact performance indicators have not been made official, but you can bet they're going to align with industry needs. The document is replete, uh, imbued, it's dripping with industry needs and industry uh, comes up over and over again. What do we know from Ontario? Well, Ontario was the first to adopt the performance-based funding in this new iteration in Canada. And they've gone with things like graduate earnings, employment rate, employment in a related field, and industry funding among the 10 that they chose uh, to reward or, or punish universities for not living up to these, uh, these metrics. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned the Tennessee model in your opening, Scott, because I want to talk a bit about this much vaunted high stakes Tennessee model, which for them includes time to completion and it's a six year graduation piece that they're looking for. You can be sure that our governments are talking about adding extra supports to ensure that uh, students in jeopardy of not completing will be supported. This is not what uh, has happened in Canada. The performance-based funding hasn't come with extra money. It's been a funding cut. And so this metric itself is loaded with assumptions about students uh, being in situations that are uh, you know, in a very stable situation where uh, completing their degree is the only thing on their plate. But without supports for helping students who face other challenges, uh, I think about single parents and working students working several jobs or in an unstable housing situation or who are otherwise financially challenged, uh, this is actually working against them, this metric, and it works against uh, the university who's trying to, who, who would try to push students out after uh, in order to meet this metric. But you don't have to take my word for it. Uh, the effect of large-scale performance-based funding in higher ed has been looked at by researchers like Jason Ward and Ben Ost. Uh, here, they looked at Ohio and Tennessee because Ohio and Tennessee have uh, 
basically, well, as you said, Tennessee was one of the first to adopt the performance-based funding system in the United States, but also puts almost all of the money on the line. So in these states, uh, these are called high stakes uh, performance-based funding. And what these researchers found, see where it is here, Ohio and Tennessee, where nearly all state funding is tied to performance-based measures. Um, what they found was we find no evidence that these programs improve key academic outcomes, none. And the metrics they use aren't uh, all the same as the metrics that Ontario has proposed and that I'm almost certain Manitoba will adopt. There's another piece here. Let's take a, and there's their conclusion. Uh, I should put it on so you can see for yourself. Despite having dramatically higher stakes than other states, we find no evidence that the performance-based funding enacted in Ohio and Tennessee had an effect on key academic outcomes. Now, lastly, I'd like you to take a look at some of the GOP lawmakers that are in Tennessee. Uh, here's what one had to say about higher education. Tennessee state GOP lawmaker says getting rid of higher education would save America. He later recanted, uh, said he was only kidding, but he did say this on a conservative talk show. And uh, so you get an idea of where this is kind of coming from. So I want to talk a little bit about today's labor market. The first thing you should note is that universities do not control the labor market. And second, the rationale for using the current labor market realities to direct future post-secondary education, uh, to direct future education funding is dubious at best. A case in point is Alberta's optimistic investment in petroleum engineers 10 years ago and the reality of the job market those graduates now face. In a similar vein, 10 years ago, few predicted the mushrooming demand for social media managers, engineers specializing in uh, sustainability. And as my attention turns to headlines these days, I feel compelled to add epidemiologists. So looking at employment rate and graduate earnings, Ortegas and his team did a systematic review of this and, and and he published in the educational evaluation and policy analysis this is a, a very good journal it's out of sage it's an aera journal for those in education you'll know a aera is the biggest uh educational uh, association in the world it's the american educational research association and basically what they found is that universities will be rewarded for taking students with the most social capital so Ortegas and his team undertook a systematic and comprehensive review of 52 of the best peer-reviewed studies uh, that were published between 1998 and 2019 that examined the outcomes of performance-based funding in the 41 U.S. states that adopted the funding model. After meticulous review, they concluded that performance-based funding is generally associated with null or modest positive effects on the on the intended outcomes of retention and graduation. But there is compelling evidence that performance based funding policies lead to unintended outcomes related to restricting access, gaming of the system, and it disadvantage and disadvantages for underserved student groups and under resourced institutions. So indeed, Ortegas and his teams Research confirms what many of us feared, tying student enrollments to specific outcomes such as graduate earnings and graduate employment rate will skew funding towards institutions that enroll, st that enroll students with the best chances of, of being employed at the highest pay immediately after graduation. So that favors students with the most social capital. Such an approach will happen at the expense of prospective students from Canada's most marginalized groups, since equally qualified but racialized Canadians are hired with less frequency and for less pay than their non-racialized counterparts. Thus, these plans will sabotage any hopes for equity, diversity, and inclusion gains among students pursuing post-secondary education. And here you can see their abstract 
you don't have to read it all. I'll leave it up for a second uh, so you can get a bit of the flavor of that paper. It's essentially what I read. Here I say, let's not rob our youth of options and choices of program of study, nor should governments be judging or devaluating such decisions or devaluing such decisions when students choose lower paying careers that they find to be more meaningful and fulfilling, especially when many of these professions are vitally important to the health of our communities and society. Moreover, given that students are increasingly asked to shoulder a greater percentage of the cost of their degree programs, tackling the growing cost of tuition would seem a much more useful direction for a policy reboot to take. This is not to suggest that students shouldn't be presented with accurate employment and income data for each program so that they may, so they may make informed choices but to judge or punish them or universities for a fluctuating job market over which they have little control is plainly wrong. Let's look at another uh, piece here, employment in a related field. It's precisely in the fields of thinking and people skills where universities excel, with the main benefit being that these skills are portable and may be applied in many different and ever-changing and evolving contexts. They are flexible and global rather than overly narrow and context specific. And I, I find this metric especially perplexing when we know that our graduating students are increasingly faced with the gig economy where they'll be changing jobs frequently. And what we want are that flexibility. We want skills, these general skills that can be applied in many different specific contexts, not this uh, narrowing and a uh, narrowing and making them context specific. Some of you may have seen this article that appeared recently in uh, University Affairs. But in the article, they note, uh, she note, the author notes, most audiences probably don't know, for instance, that in recent years, the growth of liberal arts graduates entering the tech workforce has actually outstripped growth in computer science and engineering graduates doing so. In fact, the Conference Board of Canada has recently examined what skills are needed in the workforce. Once again, it would seem the often devalued liberal arts education grad would be quite well positioned. Given that the top skills sought are, and here's uh, where you can see them, uh, things like active listening, critical thinking, reading skills, reading comprehension. Uh, later, they have writing, coordinating, monitoring, speaking. These are the skills that the labor market desperately seeks and where we can excel and where we do excel. Uh, the other part to note on this, I think, is you may be surprised to what's at the bottom, what's not being sought, what's not really in demand. And that's a uh, very specific skills that the government keeps telling us is in demand and is needed. Well, the conference board is hardly a left-wing organization and they're in agreement with what many educators have been saying for some time that uh, in, in their findings here, uh, where they're not looking for programming or people with technology design or very specific skills. That's, that's not the skill set that they're looking for. Uh, they're looking for critical thinking, active listening, reading comprehension, these global skills. I want to move now to industry research. Industry funding is another metric that uh, the Ford government has put forth, and you can probably be sure will be included in Manitoba's top 10 metrics if that's what they go with. Well, think about this metric for a minute. This metric perverse i can't believe how perverse uh, this metric is because this approach will tie public funding to private funding and will clearly incentivize the further commercialization of university research so not only do you kind of starve the university for funding and have them have to seek uh, funding in other places and they often find that in the welcoming arms of industry 
uh, to make up some of the difference, but that comes with a bargain, of course. Lots of those agreements come uh, with uh, non-disclosure agreements. They come with secretive research, uh, delay to publication. Industry can bury data. All of these things have happened in the Canadian context. But what this will do is actually reward the university. So the funding you're getting now, that you're now competing against a certain set of metrics, uh, industry funding will be doubly rewarded is sort of putting it on steroids. Not only do you get the industry funding and all the strings that that comes with, but that's how you reach your own funding for the, for the university. Such an emphasis impacts society by devaluating, devaluing less costly, but no less important scholarship, including risky and yet innovative research, community engaged research, and other valuable research endeavors that cannot easily be measured or reflected by a simple financial calculus. Rather than uncovering groundbreaking new ideas, following uncertain but innovative paths that become potential game changers, or working in the service of the communities in which our universities reside, scholars will be incentivized to get in and out of the research initiative and funding cycles with something, anything that ticks the suitable boxes. Making matters worse is the perverse incentivization of competition between universities rather than collaboration. Another piece with uh, all of these metrics is the growing administrative costs. Imposing performance-based funding systems will invariably lead to the addition of yet another layer of costly bureaucracy at both institution and ministry levels. Universities will need to create new or reclassified management positions whose sole purpose will be to assess, report, target, and ultimately game the metrics. On the government side, bureaucrats will be needed to gather, evaluate, monitor, and in the longer term, respond to the manipulated metrics, as well as all of their unintended consequences. I want to open up now for the ending. I'm almost done. But something that's been on my mind lately quite a bit is how universities are an overlooked player in determining healthy democracies. Universities must continue to be valued and upheld for their core missions, which go well beyond serving as entrepreneurial training centers existing solely to meet industry and labor market needs. Rather, universities must continue to be valued for their important role in fostering the development of critical and creative graduates capable of fully participating in both our modern economies and our democracies. Where our grads not only have the skills to prosper today, but are capable of imagining and implementing a better tomorrow in order to create a future where we can all thrive. As the university becomes increasingly industries handmade, it cannot perform its other function, which is seldom mentioned, and that is to act as a counterbalance and check on power, including from industry and government. Academia, after all, joins the legislature, the judiciary, and a free press as the institutions that serve as a check on those in power and supports a healthy democracy. We are in parallel with the judiciary, both the courts and professors bear professional responsibility primarily to the public itself, not to those who appointed them, nor to the governments of the day. And what has me alarmed is we've increasingly seen that democracy is in danger. Recently, we've seen attempts to overthrow democratically elected governments in both Canada and the United States, which certainly gives one pause. It's an important reminder that democracy is vulnerable and fragile. Just how fragile comes into focus when we consider we're in the midst of a global democratic recession. From extreme examples like the outright takeover of universities in Hungary to the massive crackdown and firing of 6,000 scholars in Turkey, in many countries across the world, academic freedom is endangered as authoritarian minded governments seek to control their universities. Closer to home, our neighbors to the south are currently engaged in a new and more troubling reprise of the McCarthyist Cold War era, when there was little tolerance for suspected communist ties and many academics were forced to
to sign loyalty oaths and interrogated and even terminated. The Brookings Institute reports that at least 29 states have or plan on passing legislation banning entire areas of study, like critical race theory, with many of these bans extending well into higher education. When you add to that, states like Georgia, who have recently eliminated tenure, none of this bodes well for what was once thought to be a paragon of democracy. Meanwhile, in Canada, critical and creative habits of mind, as well as collaborative communication and civic engagement skills and discovery-driven research are being pushed aside as universities are directed and financially rewarded to focus on graduate employment earnings, graduate employment rate in a related field, and research funding from industry sources in the most profound policy changes to hit the Canadian post-secondary sector in decades. In return for de defending a robust academic freedom, a country's university faculty are enabled to speak truth, act as a check on government, and help foster critical and creative participatory citizens whose formation prepares them for a lifetime of democratic engagement. But of course, institutions of higher learning are not, they're one site, not the only site for teaching and learning and practicing these critical skills and habits of mind. The academic and freedom entrusted to faculty is usually described in one of two ways. The first manner aligns academic freedom with rights, privileges, freedom. The second brings in concepts such as responsibility, duty, whistleblower, whistleblower protection. The first description is often used by critics who inevitably trot out the ivory tower metaphor to describe the academy. The second is found in the language used by its defenders. It's in the language that I like to use. It, its metaphor is one of a lighthouse. In the second concept, every tenured professor is a potential whistleblower, a societal lighthouse keeper, and can work in tandem with a free press for reporting on elected governments and their policies and providing a real transparency and accountability. It is a delicate balance where the scales can easily be tipped in the opposite direction. It is not difficult to imagine the potential for wealthy private donors, multinational corporations, a populist mob, or even the government itself to bring it all down. As more countries flirt with democratic backsliding, we should all be concerned. A country's tolerance and respect for academic freedom serves as a key indicator of the health of its democracy. Let's not, let's not ignore this important warning, or I like to say, let's not ignore the canary in the campus. Thank you. So that ends uh, my talk. I don't. I think I came in a little bit longer than last night, but uh, I'm really looking forward to engaging in questions. And maybe Zach, you could uh, kind of take that part. And and I can't wait to have a, a, a long talk with you. Uh, I think I'm handing that off to uh, Dr. Forbes uh, to uh, moderate the Q and A. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, questions for Dr. Spooner. That was that was a, a fantastic, uh, comprehensive seminar. Um, I've got um, oodles of questions, but um, uh, let's open it up. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Hare, I see your hand up. So, thank you for that, Scott and Mark. Thank you again for a very enlightening talk. Um, it's certainly abundantly clear from last night and tonight that the adoption of this performance-based funding will prove disastrous. Mm -hmm for institutions of higher learning and for society in general. You mentioned that this assault though in Manitoba stems from section 2.5 of our province's Advanced Education Administration Act, which clearly does outline the prospect for performance metrics assessing the use of government support. But there's also right under that, I noticed a, a section 2.6 that's labeled considerations and limitations. And I couldn't see anything in that ex that explicitly mentions limitations on the adoption of performance metrics. But I'm wondering if you're familiar enough with the act to suggest if there's anything within that section that could be levered to serve as protection against the implementation of this sort of performance-based funding. I think that's an excellent question. And I'm not a lawyer, it's not my, my area. Uh, 
in, in my case, I haven't seen places there uh, that would serve as a protection. The one place uh, which may be uh, more fruitful would be in the University Act itself, the, the, the one for each of your universities. Each, each university has its own act, often provincially, most often provincially. Some, of course, some universities have a federal charter, not, not many, I think Queens and, and perhaps a few others. But uh, I would look there for, for some nuggets that could maybe offer. I think though, you know, going from our discussion last night, it's it's really important for the public to understand what's at stake and, and for students to, to, for these allyships to change the narrative that this isn't a performance, this is deformance. Uh, you're actually deforming the university and creating a, an entrepreneurial training center, which is not its intended place. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that increasingly people ought to consider the university's role in a healthy democracy. That piece, in my mind, hasn't been talked about a lot. Um, and, and I think that it really necessitates more engagement. The public needs to know what we do without jargon, without condescension. And, and I, I think that there is a, a good place to start. No, An excellent, you, excellent question, James. Thank you, Mark. Other questions. Um, I see we have a question about um, how do we know it's the Tennessee model that the, the Manitoba government intends. I, I can answer that quickly. The, the Pallister government announced that yeah. um, in 2019. Uh, so that was in their public documents. Um, uh, if you just uh, search, because I did it recently, uh, preparing for these talks, it'll come up. There's, I, I think, at least two, one in the Winnipeg Free Press and one in the CBC, talking about the Tennessee model and and the governments, uh, that's where they were kind of getting the inspiration. Other questions? Um, just looking for hands up here. So, um, Mark, how do you uh, uh, view performance metrics with respect to, to undergraduate um, graduation versus professional schools? So it would seem that, that this would discourage people from going on to be lawyers and pharmacists. Um, uh. Well, it, in some ways, uh, I think the university will be encouraged to push the professional schools because their graduates will kind of come out more job ready and, and be employed more quickly. The time frame I've seen for that graduate earnings is anywhere from six months to two years. So. Um, it often takes the liberal arts a little bit longer to for their graduates to find where they want to apply these great but flexible skills that they've they've learned and honed. Um, I think if we're, if we're talking about wanting to improve graduate retention, let's talk about supports. Let's look at um, who's coming back from year one to year two and who are we um, not serving as best we can, and then let's target supports to the, that those groups. Uh, I think that there's a, an important place we could gather information, and the universities I think would be all too willing to do it. Uh, no one wants to see dropouts, I don't think, or stopouts or pushouts. Uh, nobody wants to see that. Um, the other place universities have really been uh, the direction they've been going without the need for the stick of performance-based funding is uh, work integrated learning. We, we, if, you, if you look at co-op programs, practicums, uh, service learning, work integrated programs, those have uh, mushroomed across Canada. Almost every program now has some form of practicum or visiting in the field or some authentic piece. And, and I think that there again, universities are all too happy to collect tuition uh, from students and have them go out in the field and and get some employment skills. Students, from their perspective, like it because it often leads to employment. And uh, the government and industries like it too. You know, you're seeing what the grads are doing. But all of that was achieved before post uh, post secondary were put under a performance based funding system. So we we're already moving in that direction. And I think that. Again, if we want to support students, we should look at who's not coming, who are we uh, not encouraging, and, and how can we do a better job of supporting them and their success, including 
writing centers and teaching and learning centers in the university, uh, helping professors become better teachers. And, and then on the student support side, there are all kinds of other financial support and also academic supports that the universities often are in a position then where they have to make cuts there. Uh, so it's counter to the goal that we all want to try to graduate students and have them be as successful as they can be. So a, a roundabout answer to that one, I think. Okay, um, we have uh, more questions from the, the audience. Uh, John Thomas, uh, I've got you next on my list. So, so. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mark, uh, again, for that great talk. I've been thinking about this since yesterday, and this is not so much a question as a comment that I'll invite you to respond to. There seems to me to be a fundamental contradiction in between the, this law and this approach to higher education and the people who are making it, in that, uh, as you've pointed out quite clearly, th this is the government trying to mess around with supply and demand in terms uh, of, of labor market outcomes, coming from a conservative government, uh, from a right-wing government that would typically be all about free market and not interfering uh, in industry and not interfering in in the economy as much as possible. And I'm wondering if there's something we can do about that, some some way we can use that language uh, to make them understand, and I'm not typically a, a highly free market person myself, I don't have a problem with government interfering in markets, but this seems to be one instance where I would actually say, yeah, leave this part of the market alone, we're handling it pretty well. Um, I think I'll stop there. Well, you know, I, I think that that's an excellent point. I think that these uh, conservative governments, and let's be clear, I'm not being uh, unfairly, I'm not unfairly picking on them. They're conservative governments who are adopting and implementing performance-based funding. Uh, these governments often like to champion the fact that they're cutting red tape and, and allowing more choice. Uh, performance-based funding does neither. It increases bureaucracy and uh, lessens choice for, for students. The, the other great irony here, and I don't know if, if people know this one, but these uh, parent free market champions of government, these, these governments, actually performance-based funding and key performance indicators uh, would feel very well at home in the former Soviet Union. This is Soviet planning, central planning from the Soviet Union. And let's, you, you know, and they actually did this. Let's, if they, measured output for their factories say we're talking screws uh and they measured volume well then they the factory would make its uh, smallest screws because okay, they would oh look how well we're doing on these key performance indicators if they measured it by weight they'd make their largest screws but always oversupplying the market in some areas and under supplying the market in other areas so uh that's the the great irony here is that these coercive techniques are come right out of Soviet planning. Um, we've got, I've got uh, Richard next and then Eric, uh, and I've got a couple of questions in the chat box, which we'll do after Eric. So uh, Richard. Um, okay. um, hi, Mark. Thanks. That was really great. Uh, it was really good to have all of that stuff collected in one succinct, concise piece. Um, I don't think any of it if you've been following any of this was a surprise. I mean, my, my big questions are really about what do we do about it? Um, and I just, I, I've been thinking about this from my perspective. So I'm, I'm the head of the Department of City Planning at the U of M. And um, so my question really is, is often about how can we tap into the professions to fight this rather than fighting it alone? Um, I know in my profession, it's a very strange profession in many ways. Um, and one is that it's incredibly politically silenced because most of our graduates work for government. And it leaves us um, as in the academy as, as having to do a lot of the critical work because we sort of from the outside of practice have to have to push the boundaries. But the profession, not the professionals, um, is, is taking some interesting steps that I think are critical to understanding 
that planning ethics shouldn't just go where industry pushes them. And so, you know, I, I wonder about partnerships and I'm assuming that other professions are going through similar um, evolutions, similar growth patterns. And if there's ways that we can be partnering with the professions that we feed to, to, to fight this because the planning profession knows it needs critical practitioners. Yeah, I, I think uh, those kinds of partnerships are, are right in line with my own thinking. And, and I, I think that's a, an important piece that wasn't mentioned last night, uh, getting the professional sector, the, those uh, bodies together. I, I think uh, allying with students and their parents is important too. If parents could understand that this is actually a further offloading of tuition onto their, their kids, uh, and, and if students understood that this will provide less choice and, and uh, really in a paternalistic manner telling them where they should go and that some jobs are more meaningful because they make more money, uh, they earn more, I, I think that these all have to be countered. I, I said it last night, I, I think that uh, politicians need to be reminded too our lawmakers need to be reminded that this is an intergenerational theft of opportunity, that they themselves benefited from affordable tuition and, and are now putting this all too much on a uh, further burden onto, to, onto students through tuition. And a student shouldn't have to graduate with a mortgage on their house of knowledge, uh, is something I, I like to say. And uh, I've also thought that uh, it's clear from the Conference Board of Canada and other researchers, uh, other other demands, other that the liberal arts are in demand. It's just I, I think when parents and students are faced with high tuition costs and they need to make a decision about what programs they're going to eventually go into, that has to factor into it. Some, especially if you're a first time uh, in your family going to university, you're going to want some guarantees that you're going to get a job right away. And so I think people fall to the professional faculties there but um i, I think if but the, you but, I, but the professional yeah. faculties also want students who have good liberal arts backgrounds yeah I, I think that that needs to be well uh raised and and brought to the attention of of uh, popular media and, and 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 to to uh the communities in which our universities reside i, I think that's definitely a piece i don't know if are you thinking other ways we can make these partnerships? I, I honestly, I I've only just started thinking about these sort of beyond the boundaries of the academy partnerships. And I mean, I can certainly talk to my own profession, but I don't know how to talk to some of the others. Uh, but I think maybe within the university, the professional schools need to get together to talk about how to approach their professions. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, Eric, uh, you have a question. So, so. Yeah, um, I, I was thinking about the, the free market critique. I, I, I mean, to me, this seems um, quite unlike the Soviet approach to uh, economic planning. I, I, I mean, Gauss plan never had any uh, influence over education, and it's actually something that's sometimes talked about as a flaw in Soviet economic planning. It, it, it more seems to me... Um, uh, of the neoliberalism using, you know, the, the, the sort of analysis of somebody like Quinn Slobodian saying that um, it's an appeal to the free market that really uses the state in a heavy handed way, um, that, that that's what the core of neoliberalism is. It's, it's the, the um, shielding of, of um, uh, capital uh, by a heavy handed use of the state. Um, and, and, and so I wonder, like, given the conference board isn't, you know, usually an anti-capitalist organization, um, what's the constituency that's really pushing this? Um, and, and, you know, if private industry wants us, uh, you know, wants good liberal arts degrees, uh, wants the skills and lists among the conference boards, you know, priorities, the, these liberal arts skills, where's the demand for this coming? And are, are we seeing an, an ideological faint or a, a, a you know and and a desire to gut universities is this something that um ideologically people have picked up or or 
or is there an interest group that's pressing it? I, I, I mean, in other words, is this an ideological project or an actual sort of concern for parts of an educational mandate that aren't being met? One, I want to revisit one piece. The, the key performance indicators is definitely out of Soviet planning and, and how they ran their industries. That, the literature is replete if you go, if you read uh, performance-based funding in terms of uh, putting consequences on key performance indicators, that, that is uh, very clear coming out even with, you know, in 76, Campbell's Law, if you heard about Campbell's Law, the, the more you put an emphasis on a target, the more it deforms uh, the thing that it's set out to measure. And, and he, he, all of the, his studies were looking at Soviet planning uh, in terms of industry, maybe not on their universities, but definitely on their uh, industries. But on your other part, I think that these are tired, broken ideas from governments bereft of, of anything better. Uh, I, I think there are clever ways to make a funding cut in, in one way, because you can then uh, the university blames themselves for not measuring up against these metrics. I, I think that that's partially a piece. I think it probably sells well. Uh, anytime people are getting tough on uh, academics and those lazy professors with their tenure, that kind of trope, I think sells well in some uh, right wing circles. But w what are you thinking, Eric? Like, uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to seek the constituency that wants a worse university in Manitoba. Um, and, and I can think of it like there's a small groups of, of uh, conservatives that, you know, maybe certainly are anti-intellectual, um, certainly, you know, maybe resent us for wanting to be paid and housed. But, but I think there's a widespread constituency that wants students educated and wants them, you know, the, the idea of getting work is sort of attractive to, to parents um, as well. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, given that there does seem to be a private sector, um, you know, take the conference board as, yeah. as private sector group that's speaking up for, you know, not broadly democracy, but specific job-based skills. I'm wondering where the impetus is to relate like that there's a vision that the university has gotten it wrong. And, you know, I, I guess looking for rent seekers that are looking for specific training that's carried over in the university or, or some group that feels that what the university is producing um, that that would be putting their money and effort to you know encourage the conservatives to go in this direction rather than another direction did, or did you have the convoy uh, protests in manitoba yep i would say there's a constituency that has no respect for knowledge or expertise or university i i know out here the it's maybe different in manitoba but, it, but in, definitely in saskatchewan the our saskatchewan party gets uh is worried about the right flank, not the left flank, and and so does try to throw, you know, uh, some attention to uh, the sort of Buffalo Party that that kind of uh, that line. It's it's more from the the right flank and not the left. I think the same is true in Alberta. I, I'm not sure about Manitoba, but definitely there is a segment of society that would be all too happy to get rid of universities or or have them. Uh, only serve industry needs and a very limited view of industry. Uh, I, but I think if you talk to the, the real captains of industry, I, you're right, I, I don't think that this would well serve them. And, and so you you wonder why, where is it coming from? You, you know, there's uh, the influence of the, I think the Fraser Institute, uh, which is funded by the Koch brothers. I don't know how far you want to go in, in terms of uh, following the lines of influence here, but uh, it, it's definitely sells in some segments of conservative uh, po political, you know, it's politically expedient in some conservative circles to attack the university and especially tenure. I think we're a pain in their butt too. I think that uh, when you look at curriculum, if you look at the example in Alberta with the K to 12 curriculum that they were trying to sort of push on to the teachers, it was a lot of university professors speaking out and, and uh, making it difficult 
I think here in Saskatchewan, and I'm guessing it wouldn't be any different in Manitoba, a lot of the vocal opposition to uh, policies that aren't informed by by evidence uh, are faculty. Yeah. But yeah, I'd love to hear your. Th let's go a bit further. What you don't do you agree or? Well, no, I, I, I do agree. It's, it's, I, I think there's a tension um, and a tension that we can probably exploit in resisting between the, you know, tensions within conservatism. And um, um, you're right. I think that there is a resistance to ideological criticism uh, sometimes that just seems to want to resist it altogether. And um, if it's coming from faculty, then faculty are bad to be doing it. But but it seems the economic interests are really complicated in how it it, it relates to this program. Anyway, so it's, it's not disagreeing, I think. It's more trying to figure out what's going on. Um, um, so. Well, even in listening to this exchange, when I think about it, um, you know, maybe it's time to start a group called the Friends of Manitoba Post-Secondary Ed, if there isn't already. I just started one in Saskatchewan, and Alberta has uh, that group, Friends of... Uh, Alberta post-secondary and and you may find some unexpected allies uh, and I think of what you're saying Eric in terms of captains of industry may actually come and be an ally along with the other groups that you would more expect like the students and professional groups and and faculty associations which are really the ones uh, uh, pushing governments and fighting for the aspirational ideals of the university in the in the first place so the last decade or so in Canada, it's the faculty associations, I think, that are upholding and fighting to uphold those ideals more than uh, other groups that you might think uh, would. Thanks. Thanks again. So I'm, I'm uh, looking at the clock here. We didn't want to go too far past the top of the hour. So I've got two more questions from Barry and Allison. But before that, uh, we'll do a couple of questions from the chat box, and then we'll finish up with, with Barry and Allison. So uh, Aaron had a question, how much time do we have to fight back and make sure this doesn't pass? Um, so. Well, uh, you're, you have an election 2023, I think. Is that correct? Yeah. And uh, from my understanding, the current government is pretty shaky. Uh, your premier has made several faux pas in the last, just in the last few days, there are weeks that I've been following. Uh, I, so I think there is an avenue to uh, attack and they there and, and to form allyships uh, to, to show that this is not going to lead to any of the great outcomes that they're putting out. Uh, and I think they'd be loath to have another battlefront, although I, I don't know, you know, the context better, better than I do. But, um, um, our next question is from Michael Miner. Um, uh, Manitoba also introduced Bill 33, the Advanced Education Administration Amendment Act, which allows the government to adjust tuition by program and institution. The government has said this is to keep tuition affordable. How might control over tuition be used to enforce performance-based funding? Well, uh, you can definitely use it by jacking up liberal arts and, and making engineering lower, things like that, that again, are very hands-on approaches to what is supposed to be uh, students driven choice from a heavy handed government. So uh, I think there is an example where they had to amend the act because of student resistance. If I'm not mistaken, students played a pretty big role in that amendment because of the student fees uh, and the Ontario, uh, you know, the court judgments that this was uh, beyond the authority of, of the government. Uh, to, to curtail student fees or make them make them opt in. Uh, so I think there's some avenues for sure to uh, to get the students on board that th this can work. But yeah, differential tuition fees uh, that can really uh, keep people out and push people towards other programs that they don't necessarily want to study or have their heart in. Okay, um, how about if we wrap up with a, a couple more questions from the audience and Barry Stevenson is up next. So, so. Yeah, just a really quick observation that this performance based budget modeling is coming here and we have an incumbent liberal government. So I think it's a problem that 
that transcends any particular government that might be in power. And I, I think if you're looking for the constituency, it's an effort to privatize a public asset. So I think in the end, big capital is actually behind a lot of these initiatives that are coming down the pipe. So people like Moya Green, for example, is actually integral to what's happening here uh, in Newfoundland, if you know anything about her past. Yeah, uh, same in Ontario, I guess the first uh, strategic mandate agreements with key performance indicators uh, under was uh, under a liberal government, although that never did pass. And those uh, indicators were much different. They're much more on the research side, looking at um, the, they're equally or just as troubling, but uh, those performance metrics were more like uh, tri-council funding and, uh, you know, journal impact factors, th things like that, looking at that side. Okay, well, um, uh, our last uh, uh, questioner is my UFA colleague, Alison Bricky. So Alison, uh, you're batting cleanup tonight. So. <laughs> Thanks so much. Sorry, I don't have my camera on. This is a, one of those dreaded academic comments, not a question, but uh, I really appreciated your talk. Thank you so much. It struck me as you were speaking how um, this idea that we have of universities as hotbeds of leftist, liberal, activist-minded, you know, faculty who are um, anti-conservative really el elides the the economic realities of universities in Canada and and the U.S. that are increasingly structured as corporate corporations, you know, that are deeply inequitable to to their staff. Some of whom, you know, an increasing amount of whom are adjuncts making below minimum wage with no benefits or job security, and it and it creates this kind of false idea of the university that's completely um i think not in step with what we've seen happen um in in the way that capitalism has kind of evolved the institution over time so it's really dangerous in that way too and then and you know you see in the united states too this you know funding of 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 sports teams over faculties or yeah the 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 critique of, of critical race theory as you know shouldn't, shouldn't be taught anymore and there's all these ways i think that universities are, are already deeply vulnerable to these conservative ideologies that that doesn't need um it doesn't need any an, another push but but yeah it's that's just one thing i wanted to add thanks yeah and i know you talk about cancel cultures uh canceling entire areas of study is uh the real cancel culture that's going on there in the United States, and it's very alarming. Well, um, that I think brings us to an end. Um, uh, we, we don't want to keep people here too long, but uh, Mark, do you have any um, final uh, parting remarks? You want to, uh, any uh, wisdom you want to uh, pass along to the, the crowd uh, before we wrap up? I think just uh, to keep making the links, I don't, I don't think it's uh, wisdom. It's 101 kind of stuff of making links with as many constituencies as possible, including uh, industry and, and student groups, parents. Um, and and I think that, that it has to be countered. I think the performance part has to be countered that this isn't about performance. This is about l skewing and, and very much limiting what counts as performance for universities. Uh, in the chat, I see someone's asking if this sets up more barriers for Indigenous learners, and I, I think it absolutely does. Um, and, and especially carried on further, you'll see the erosion of smaller institutions in, in communities. And uh, these kinds of metrics, industry funding favors larger institutions, that's for sure, as does um, the kinds of bureaucracy that are needed uh, the economies of scale are such that uh, larger institutions will have the more resources to be able to do that and more resources to lobby government in the first place to get more favorable metrics. So um, when I think of first time university goers in a family, they'll often risk uh, doing so in their own home communities and they often have other responsibilities in their communities. So the idea of leaving their communities to go to, to university, especially if it's they're the first in their family. This is a further barrier to that. And, and it's a tu increasing of tuition. It's make no mistake, these are funding cuts. Yeah, um, 
I've, I've scribbled down a Mark Spooner quote here, students shouldn't graduate with a mortgage on the house of knowledge. I'm gonna use that. Uh, and and uh, I, I'd just like to thank you on behalf of MOFA and, and the entire audience for a terrific seminar, which was comprehensive, informative, and brings uh, us up to speed on the dangers um, of performance-based funding. So, so thank you um, again for, for another uh, terrific seminar. So, so. Thank you for that. And thanks for the opportunity. I look forward to working on this in the future. I, I, wanted, I, I want the CAUT and the different faculty associations across the country to work together uh, to learn from each other effective techniques and to just create a unified lobbying group. So I think there's lots we can do here still. Absolutely. I'll talk to David Robinson, Mark. I, I will. I, I email him frequently <laughs> enough. And if you do, Patrick, that'd be great. Oh, I will. I will. Okay, Zach, um, anything uh, you want to add? Some... Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming out. Uh, I know we're all tired of webinars after two years of the pandemic, but uh, really, really great. Uh, to have everyone out, and if folks want to organize or to agonize, uh, feel I put my email into the chat. Uh, I spelled it incorrectly, actually, uh, but feel free to do so. Reach out to me, and uh, happy to um, you know if folks want to start making that uh, that connection, uh, happy to do so.